Um, Honorable Dr. Roberta Metzolo, Excellency, distinguished professors and researchers, well, dear friends, while it is truly my pleasure to open this policy discussion organized by the University, University of Warwick in collaboration with the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy and the University of Malta, we are meeting in the shadow of another tragedy in the Mediterranean. Yesterday's events witnessed the deaths of over 30 more people, mostly infants. Let us keep the loss of these lives in our minds as a reminder of the real toll which migration is taking in our region and across our world. Let us also remember the timely work of NGOs and authorities struggling to bring much needed support and assistance. We must keep them all in our thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. I feel privileged that when I visited the University of Warwick last year, I was given an overview of this important project. I am pleased to know that this research, which has been carried out across key Mediterranean island points of arrival and migration routes, has been launched in Brussels, which I hope will stimulate discussion with the European Union policymakers and civil society. Not only is this research keeping us updated about recent developments in policy, but I am sure that the recommendations emanating from it are proposing a way forward to improve our policy responses by member states. My contribution today shall focus on two teams, which I believe have been essential to the successful outcomes of the crossing the Mediterranean Sea by boat project. Firstly, the importance of listening and acting upon the shared experiences and narratives of migrants themselves as collaborators in the process of policy review and necessary changes. Secondly, the need for us to use these narratives as an opportunity to challenge our status quo with deeper and more critical questions. I believe that in doing so, we can motivate all stakeholders to replace systems of exclusion and precarity with a more inclusive and participatory society. I would like to share with you an experience which I had. I was recently invited to launch a report published by the, by the Migrant Women Association of Malta, which highlights the importance of participative approaches to research. This report directly engaged with migrant women in Malta. It showed that 85% of female asylum seekers are unemployed, even though nearly half of them have been actively looking for employment for over a year. The report presented by the Migrant Women Association of Malta clearly reflects the multiple levels of discrimination often faced by migrant women. Such discrimination is not only on the basis of their gender, but also because of their ethnicity and cultural background. This report clearly states that these multiple factors are blocking migrant women out of the job market. Despite half of the women participants in this research having completed secondary schooling and 20% having a university education, nearly three quarters of migrant women currently in employment in Malta are working without a contract and legal protections. Listening to the experiences of these women has therefore been crucial. We must continue to ensure that the narratives of all migrants are heard and that they have a place at our discussion tables. The experiences of migrants must influence the development of sensitive and relevant policies in this sector. In so doing, we shall be creating an inclusive and participative approach to policy making in this country, across the European Union and beyond. Let me draw your attention to another report published earlier this year by the Jesuit Refugee Service and the Auditus Foundation. The report found that 80% of asylum seekers who were surveyed are living at risk of poverty, which is more than five times the rate in the general Maltese population. Meanwhile, 2015 indicators from Eurostat revealed that migrants in general continue to face high levels of discrimination even in regular employment areas. According to the study, a shocking 38% of Maltese people said that they would be uncomfortable working with a Muslim person, 
while 38% would not accept a black working colleague. The, fi the findings of such reports from a local context show just how much more work needs to be done to improve the situation faced by migrants who find themselves in countries of transit or arrival. The multiple destinations along these journeys analyzed in crossing the Mediterranean Sea by boat project are perceived to be places of potential welcome and safety. At this point, I would like us to ask ourselves some questions to further stimulate our discussion. How many of the interviewed participants felt actually welcomed, respected and safe during their difficult journeys? What more must be done to ensure that our policies are focused on the dignity and the well-being of the individuals and their families who are crossing the Mediterranean Sea for safety? How can we create safe spaces for migrants, not only while people are on the move, but also when they attempt to settle in a new society? Understanding the economic, social, but also psychological reasons why people feel compelled to make dangerous journeys across the Mediterranean will shed more light on the struggles they have faced and the challenges that are currently being faced by migrants. Today's research opens a new perspective on the effects that our policy frameworks are having on the lives of migrants, including their expectations and their concerns. This research puts a human face and tells a human story, replacing the all too often anonymous statistics. It is these human narratives which should determine the direction and implementation of our legislative actions and policies. The experiences of migrants remind us of the need to challenge the status quo. These experiences should make us dig deeper into the diverse and complex drivers of the phenomenon of migration. The first-hand narratives of migrants also remind us of the need to review and to revise the ways we engage with the different communities who undertake perilous journeys in search of a better life. Furthermore, I believe we must continue to work together to urge our national and international authorities to ensure that safe and legal routes into countries of safety are made available. Such availability for safe and legal routes will prevent people from endangering their lives during perilous journeys which, all too often, end in tragedies. Taking a long-term perspective, we must also do more to ensure that access to necessary information is made available to migrants at each step of their journey about their legal rights in particular. We must also remember that certain migrants are more vulnerable than others. These include unaccompanied children who often face greater risks, as was explored during the recent conference organized by Missing Children Europe in collaboration with the President's Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, entitled Lost in Migration. One very telling fact kept resurfacing during this conference. Migrant children fall out of the system with the risk of feeding into the business of traffickers. In fact, Europol's latest statistics show that 10,000 migrant children had gone missing in 2015. And as stated by Europol chief Rob Wainwright, this was just the tip of the iceberg, as many migrant children never register at entry points in Europe. Today also happens to be International Missing Children's Day. On this occasion, I would like to reiterate my appeal to the international community to ensure the necessary safeguards to protect all children from going missing, including migrant children. We cannot allow the fundamental rights of children to be compromised. The dignity of children cannot be a fairy tale or simply a platitude. At this conference, we heard the first-hand experiences of migrant children who had made who had made unaccompanied journeys across the Mediterranean. The conference outcomes were presented to the European authorities, and these outcomes are already making an impact on policy directions in this sector. In this way, we are emphasizing the need for the rights of migrant children to be respected and taken seriously. As citizens of democratic countries, we must always and in all ways emphasize the effective implementation 
of the universality of our human rights to safeguard the basic dignity of every human being, whoever they might be and wherever they might come from. Ultimately, I urge each and every one of us to recognize and promote a culture of positive peace, whether as academics, as policymakers, or as civil society activists, but most of all, as the active citizens of our nations. Positive peace means that we must continue to promote a systemic, structural, and cultural transformation of our status quo. Positive peace means we must develop a culture of well-being which nurtures dignified and respectful relationships within oneself, with other persons, and with other groups within society. We must not see ourselves from an isolated and fragmented perspective. We must all be connected together in one resilient, prosperous, and inclusive community of life. This research gives us the opportunity to do just that with the narratives of migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Thanks to this opportunity, we are capable of continuing to build more empathy with others, and I hope that we can reach out to take more practical actions. I augur that such a spirit of solidarity will touch the hearts and minds of policymakers and authorities across the European Union and beyond. I hope that policymakers and authorities will read Crossing the Mediterranean Sea by boat and be compelled to take direct and effective action for the lasting benefit not only of all my people in migration, but also of all members of our societies. Thank you.